Okay, so we're starting this module by uh, looking at some introductory material on totally ordered sets and partially ordered sets, which not everyone may have seen before. Uh, we've got ten slides on this. You've got a, a much more detailed chapter which you need to read through carefully before a week on Friday when we'll have a discussion session on it. So, you've probably come across equivalence relations before, I hope so, um, and uh, so the, there are various other kinds of relations you can have, and uh, one of the things you can have is the notion of an order, a total order or a partial order, but again, you start with the idea that you have to decide whether two elements are related in some way or not. Now, you can... When you're dealing with partial orders, there are two approaches. One is to either deal with sort of the notion of less than or equals. Another is the dealing with the notion of strictly less than. And they're completely equivalent approaches. Uh, we're going to do the less than or equals approach uh, just for notational reasons, as you'll see. Anyway, so if you're dealing with a relation of some sort in general... You've no idea what sort of relation it is. You can call it rho. So you decide whether you have to have some rule that decides whether or not x is related to y. It doesn't have to be symmetrical. So you, do, you don't know whether x related to y means y is related to x. Um, in the abstract, it's really just a set of ordered pairs, um, and each ordered pair tells you this element. The first element is related to the second element, x rho y. So, because we're dealing with order relations, less than or equals or less, we won't use rho, we'll use a less than or curly equals, or sometimes just less than or equals. Um, I often use less than or curly equals to remind you that I'm not using the usual notion of less than or equals at a particular moment, or not necessarily. However, we do have the usual notion of less than or equals available. So, if you've just got a set of numbers, real numbers, natural numbers integers, rational numbers, you've got the usual notion of, of less than or equals, and uh, that's one of the relations we'll be looking at. But there are loads of others, and we're going to have a quick look at those as well. So we're going to be looking at that relation, and other relations that are a bit like it, sharing some, but possibly not all, of the same properties. So what is a total order? It's going to be something like less than or equals that we already know. But we'll use this notation less than or curly equals because it's a more abstract thing and it satisfies four rules. Uh, one advantage of dealing with strictly less than is that you only need to specify three rules um, so you can save a bit of time. But I still find less than, less than or equals slightly more intuitive. So we'll do it that way. Uh, so the first rule is the one that you definitely wouldn't have if you, were losing, if you were using strictly less than. So you insist that every element should be less than or equal itself. And if you're working with strictly less than, you don't need that axiom. Um, axiom B, this is the transitivity relation. You need that whichever version you're using. If you're doing it with strictly less than, you still need this. Uh, we're doing less than or equal, so if x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to z, then x should be less than or equal to z. So that's uh, transitivity. Now, the third axiom is that if x is less than equal to y and y is less than equal to x, then y equals x. Now, if you're using strictly less than, this takes a rather different form. When I say strictly less than is that you say x is definitely not less than x. So you throw away a, and instead you, you replace c by no element is strictly less than itself. Um, and so you can combine them that way. And, that, and in that form it's called irreflexive. Um, strictly less than is irreflexive, but we're not working with strictly less than, and I think it would be a bit odd for me to write irreflexive here. So I, I won't say that. But you can note that uh, I will note that in brackets. Strictly less than is irreflexive. Uh, 
And then for part D, again, it takes a slightly different form if you're working with strictly less than. Um, it says that if you've got a pair of elements, the relationship must hold at least one way around. Now remember, this is not a partial order yet. This is a total order. Total orders are better than partial order. And in partial orders, this last condition will be missing. So for a total order, if you take any two elements, then at least one of them must be less than or equal to the other. It could be both ways around, in which case they have to be equal because of part C. OK, so then you've got a total order on your set X. And so now you can form, let's say you've got a totally ordered set, which is the ordered pair X with less than or equals. And it's just another one of these mathematical structures. And we've got loads of examples, and we've mentioned some of them already. D doesn't, so if it's strictly less than, what you do is you say that if x is not equal to y, then at least one of them is strictly less than the other. And in fact, exactly one of them is strictly less than the other. I suppose there are various ways of combining it. You can say that, um, for, I suppose for every pair x and y, exactly one of x strictly less than y y strictly less than x, and x equals y holds. So, so there are various alternative ways of doing it. OK, so you've got a totally ordered set with the order relation less than or equals. Let's have a look at some examples. Of course, I've already mentioned some. So obviously, we know that the usual notion of less than or equals has all of those properties if you work with sets of real numbers. So take real numbers or any subset of real numbers, you can use the ordinary notion of order and you're fine. Now here's a common thing you could do. You've got uh, a particular order, you found it's a total order, you can reverse it. If you reverse a total order, you still get a total order. So this would be that x is curly less root to y if and only if y is less root to x in the other order you were thinking about. So, that just reverses the order, but it's just like reflecting in, uh, in the origin if you're working with real numbers, and it just reverses the order of everything, but it doesn't change any of the axioms. Still, every pair is related one way around or the other. It's just that everything is related the opposite way around to the way you thought before. I leave that as a little el trivial exercise. Less trivial exercise is to think of an example of a total order on natural numbers across natural numbers. I wonder if anybody's already come across one of those. Does anybody know a total order on n cos n? OK. So suppose you look at all possible pairs of positive integers, mm -hmm. and you want to try and find some relationship between them. Of course, you can define any old abstract rule you like. Does anyone know? a way of ordering them that gives you a total order. Oh. Yeah? Do you take the sort of first end and like give reference to that and then yeah. give them the equal? Yeah. The yeah, that's a good one. So that's, that's, uh, that's uh, one of the most common ones. Of course, you do it the other way around. So this is called, this is essentially what's called lexicographic or ordering because it's exactly the same as alphabetical ordering. So you give preference to the first coordinate and see and compare those. And if they're equal, then you go to the second coordinate and compare those. And if they're equal, well, the elements are equal, so you're OK. Otherwise, you'll get a comparison. And it's just like alphabetical ordering and uh, so um, in a dictionary, except that in a dictionary you've got 26 symbols. Or possibly more. So the answer we got from the audience was uh, you would say that uh, M1, N1 is less than or equal to M2, N2 if and only if, or if, you can say if you want. Um, M1 is, uh, let, let's get this right, M1, it should be 
either strictly less than M2 or M1 equals M2 and N1 is less than or equal to M2. That should do it. As I say, that's called lexicographic because it's like dictionary ordering. Okay, that's not, that's not an obvious order to think of if you haven't seen it before. Now, if you've got a totally ordered set and you take any subset, just like taking subsets of the real line, you get, still get the usual order still works. If you've got any old totally ordered set, you take a subset, you can restrict the order to it um, and you'll be fine. You have to figure out what the restriction of a relation means, but uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty clear. Any questions on what we've said so far? So far we've just done a very slight generalisation of the orders that you know and love. Total orders are also called linear orders um, and that's because if you take a few elements you can sort of draw a diagram to show them how they relate to each other and you can form them all up in a line. So, um, so, for example, if you consider one, four, seven, ten as a subset of the real line, uh, we'll use the usual order. And then you can write them under each other in what's called a Hasser diagram. I'll say more about Hasser diagrams later. From this diagram you can deduce which ones are less than which other ones. So this is an example of what I call a Hasser diagram. As you can see, they've lined up in a line, so we'll call them linear orders. When we do partially ordered sets, we're going to get much more complicated diagrams where not every element is related to every other element, and so there'll be bits hanging off, there'll be sort of trees and loops and all sorts of things like that. So now we're going to see what happens when you weaken your condition and work with partial orders. So now things get a bit more interesting. We want relations that satisfy the first three conditions but not the fourth one, which means that there may be a pair, uh, there may sometimes be some pairs which are not related either way around. Now, for me, one of the most typical examples of this is when you look at how sets relate to each other. If you're looking at different subsets of a given set and you say, and you want to use set inclusion as your relation, less than or equals. Now, if you take two random sets, there's no reason that either of them should be contained in the other one. They might overlap a bit. They may be completely disjoint. It may be that one of them is contained in the other one. So you're going to get some sets that are related by inclusion and some, which, and some pairs which aren't, generally. And this gives you a typical example of a partial order. If you look at all the subsets of a particular set, then what you get is a partially ordered set using set inclusion. So you should think of, think of that example as we look at this definition. So there's three rules this time. So again, every element is related to itself. You should think of that as saying that a set is always a subset of itself. If x is less root of y and y is less root of z, then x should be less root of z. Again, that transitivity is still there. Well, if you've got a small set that's a subset of some medium-sized set, and that medium-sized set is contained in some big set, 
Well, the smallest of the sets is contained in the biggest of the sets, so you get transitivity for subset are equal. And the third one is something that you will have used many times in order to show that sets are equal. You will have shown that every element of each set is also in the other one. So you will have probably shown the inclusion both ways round in order to determine equality. You want to show that a set A is equal to a set B. You look at every element of A and prove it must be in B. Then you look at every element of B and prove it must be in A. So that just shows you that A is contained in B and B is contained in A and so A equals B. And that's exactly what happens in this uh, condition C. And then you don't have a condition D because it's not true that if you take a random pair of sets that one of them will be contained in the other one. They might well be, as I say, completely different. Um, they might overlap a bit, but neither one contains the other. All sorts of possibilities. <coughs> OK, so suppose you've got one of these partial orders. Then, of course, you've got a partially ordered set um, with the order relation less than or equals. You don't always have to bother um, with a notation for the lesser equals, um, but sometimes you have to explain exactly which relation you're working with, and sometimes the notation can, and the terminology can get very messy, especially when you're trying to prove things about chains of subsets of partially ordered sets, which you'll come across in the uh, essential background reading. It does get really messy when there's, when there's partially ordered sets at a different level of abstraction hanging around and that can, can make things a bit tricky. Uh, right. And uh, everybody abbreviates partially ordered set to PO set because it saves a lot of writing. So, of course, all apples are fruit, but not all fruit are apples. It's every total order is a partial order, but I've already told you about some partial orders which are not total orders. So here's a little question. Is the equality relation a partial order on set of real numbers? So A is less equal to B means A equals B. Is that a partial order? What do people think? You think it is? Shall we have a vote? Who says it is a partial order? Okay. Who says it isn't a partial order? Well, it looks like we're winning 2-0. Um, OK, I go for the fact that it is a partial order. Um, and it's the, what you could call the weakest possible partial order. You know every element has to be less than or equal to itself. If you just have that and no other relations, it's still a partial order. It's sort of the trivial partial order. You, it, you have to have at least that. And if you have nothing else, then it's still a partial order, but it's not a very interesting one. It's not a total order, of course, because most pairs are not related this way. So we had lots of total orders. There are also partial orders. But here are some partial orders which are not total orders, and you get to check these. So in natural numbers, you change your notion of order, and you say that m is less than or equal to n if n is divisible by m, where you need to know what divisibility means, but I think there's no ambiguity when it comes to the natural numbers. Um, so, you get uh, here, 2 is less than or equal to curly 4, but 2 is not less than or equal to curly 5. Um, because 5 is not divisible by 2. Okay? So, we've changed the order. And, of course, 5 is not divisible by 2 either. Uh, some notation. You can say 2 is not less than or equal to 5, and 5 is not less than or equal to 2. With partially ordered sets, you need different notation because not less than or equal is different from greater than and not greater or equal is different from strictly less than. Um, as I'll, I'll, you'll see more on that in the printed notes. So uh, the notation expands a bit. 
So it is convenient to have a notation for not less than or equal and not greater or equal. Uh, remember, oh, x less or equal to y, um, you can use the notation y is greater or equal to x, even only if x is less than to y. Uh, what's his second example here? Um, R cross R, well, this time, instead of your lexicographic, you can compare the coordinates with equal weights. And you say that x1, y1 is less than equal to x2, y2, if you have both x1 less than equal to x2, and y1 less than equal to y2. Now, when you do that, it's not a total order anymore, because you get pairs which are not related. Um, so for the second of these, note that uh, 1, 3 is less than or curly equal to 2, 4, but 1, 2 and 2, 1 are not related. So 1, 2 is not less than or equal to 2, 1. And 2, 1 is not less than 1, 2. So I'll say that pair is unrelated. Because there's no relate in, they're not related either way around. Here's a more interesting example. Again, this, there are some issues with this, as we'll, we'll see. Here's one where, actually, again, less than or equals is wins over strictly less than in this example, and I'll tell you why. Doesn't have to be polynomial functions, actually. Real valued functions will do. And uh, we'll have them defined on the whole real line, uh, just for the moment. But you could do it on intervals instead. And then you want to compare two functions, like comparing two graphs with each other, when you ask, does one, one graph lie underneath the other one? But they're allowed to touch. Then we'll say one polynomial is left to another polynomial, or one real-valued function is left to another real-valued function, if, when you compare the values point by point, um, you always have p of x less to q of x. Now, so that, as I say, that gives you graphs, one under the other, they might touch, they might even be the same graph. Now, suppose you were using strictly less than notation for your partial order. Strictly less than means less than or equal to and not equal to. So, a graph which is underneath another graph but touches it somewhere will count as strictly less than in this partial order because there'll be different functions one of which is less than to the other. That means that with the partial order, strictly less than notation, even though the graphs touch, one function is strictly less than the other. Now, this is a bit of a worry. You don't have to worry about that with the less than we call notation. It works OK. Can Uh, well, there are various things you can say. Um, when you've got several of them, you have what's something called an anti-chain. So an anti-chain is a set of elements, no pair of which is related either way around. A chain is a set of elements where every pair of elements is related one way around or the other. So an anti-chain is the opposite of a chain. So you could say it's a two-element anti-chain. You could just use what I say. I just say these two elements are unrelated. I haven't got a symbol for it. Um, if anybody knows a good symbol for it, it might be a convenient one to have because it takes ages to write all of those down. But it doesn't take very long to say this pair is unrelated. I suppose as a, if, given that relation is supposed to be an, order, it, an ordered pair, there could be a slight ambiguity in saying they're unrelated. But if you, I, I mean, when I say X and Y are unrelated, I mean they're not related either way around. Right, so here's the subsets, and uh, 
abstract but useful. Now, this is just subsets of the natural numbers, but you could use, take subsets of any set. Um, take a set, consider all its subsets, then use set inclusion. That's a very good uh, partial order. So you've got A and B and X, but you decide that A is less good to B, just that means A is a subset of B. And I already talked a bit about that and why that's a partial order and not a total order. And now if you've, only, you've, got, if you've got just finitely many elements, then you can put them in a Hasser diagram, um, which shows all the relationships. Well, when I say it shows all the relationships, you do it efficiently. The idea is to draw a line so that if two elements are related, one of them will be vertically above, uh, vertically higher than, than the other one, and the line joining them will show that the relationship between them. Um, but you don't draw all the lines in because that's unnecessary, because you have transitivity. So if you see that something is below something else and a line joins them, and then it's below another and there's a line joining them, you can deduce from the transitivity the other relation. Let's, uh, as I say, Hasser diagrams will be discussed briefly in lectures. Well, I'm going to discuss it briefly in this lecture. Let me just see what's on the next slide before I do that. Uh, I'll come back to the hazard diagrams in a minute. I just want to go through these reminders. Uh, so to be a total order, you've got to satisfy all four. So the extra condition is the fourth one. Partial order just needs the first three. If you're trying to check whether something is a partial order or a total order, then as soon as you find an important condition that's failed, you don't have to check the other ones. So that makes it a bit more efficient for checking. Um, now... But you have to watch out. If condition D fails for a relation, that doesn't tell you whether it's a partial order or not. So, obviously, if any of the first three conditions fail, then, then it's going to be neither. If D fails, it might still be a partial order, but it won't be a total order, um, and so on. That's the usual thing. And you can reverse partial orders and get partial orders. Um, so, you can reverse your divisibility on the natural numbers. Um, and do, instead of doing set inclusion, um, well, it, you can do reverse set inclusion. I shouldn't say exclusion, that would not be right. Uh, so, uh, so obviously you can, you can decide which set is bigger. Sometimes it's very important to say that you've got further if you've made your set smaller. This is actually quite important when you're doing um, generalised sequences called nets in topology. We won't do nets in this module, but anybody who's interested in general topology and point set topology, it would be a good idea to find out about nets. Nets are a generalization of sequence. Uh, sequences, you have x1, x2, x3, and so on. With nets, instead, you have sort of x lambda, where lambda's in some partially ordered set of a nice kind, um, called a directed set. And so you can change your indexing set. And they're more powerful because not all topological spaces are metric spaces. And if you're not in a metric space, you normally shouldn't use sequences. You should use this thing called nets. If you're working with nets, then um, you quite often use as your directed, uh, your directed set, your, uh, a collection of sets ordered by reverse inclusion. That happens quite a lot. Like you often want to, say, pick an element in a small neighborhood and say you're getting closer to the point if you make the neighbourhood smaller, which means you've gone further along. So your sets are more advanced when they get smaller. And so reverse set inclusion is quite an important one. And of course, every subset of a partially ordered set is still a partially ordered set. And that brings us to the end of those slides. So let me finish by talking about these Hasser diagrams for partially ordered sets. I'll do it by example. So these are sort of efficient diagrams indicating the relationships between elements of a finite partially ordered set.
So, uh, for example, let's consider some numbers. Two, three, four, five, six, and seven with the divisibility partial order. That uh, M is less than or curly equal to N if um, N is divisible by M. Well, you can actually list all the relationships. Of course, everything is less than to itself, but there's no point in indicating that in a diagram. Um, let's see if I can think of a few relationships. Um, we've got 2 is less than equal to 4, 3 is less than equal to 6, 2 is less than equal to 6, and I think that's about it. So how would you draw that in a diagram? Well, I need a point for every number and lines that go up a bit to show less than or equals. So here's the Hasser diagram. I've got 2 and 3 lurking near the bottom because they're both less than or equal to 6. Um, we've got 2 less than or equal to 4 as well. But 4 is not less equal to anything else, so I can put 4 up there. Of course, you could draw each of these things in loads of different ways. And have I forgotten any? I don't think so. So what have we got? 2, 3, 4, 6, 5 and 7 live on their own. Doesn't matter where you draw them, there's no lines connecting them to any of the others. So here's your Hasser diagram. Now, I haven't really shown you the efficiency of that because um, I should have another one further up, which is divisible by 6 or something like that. Um, but you can read a bit more about that in, in the printed notes. Has anyone got any questions about the, the, how you draw hazard diagrams? So the one thing I haven't shown is that you don't draw unnecessary diagrams. Suppose I throw in... Um, let me throw in 8 as well. If I throw in 8 as well, then I have also 2 less than to 8 and 4 less than to 8. And when I say no others, apart from everything is left than to itself, of course. Um, now you, you put 8 up here. Let's, uh, I tell you what, I'll give myself a bit more room. four there, and I'll put eight up here. And I don't have to draw the extra line from two up to eight, because you can deduce it from uh, what we've already got. OK, so, so uh, again, any questions about that? Otherwise, we'll stop there for today. Um, so I'll leave it to you to read the rest of that section. It does get a lot harder once it gets on to Axiom of Choice and Zorn's Lemma and all that stuff. So there's some tough stuff in there, and we'll discuss it at the end of next week. But uh, we'll start on the uh, point set topology tomorrow with a bit of revision and then some more interesting stuff about uh, complete metric spaces and some very useful stuff on the bare category theorem and so on. OK, we'll stop there for today. Mm.